part of that process also, um, we started looking at the mistakes we were making, the bugs that were getting into live, the, the broken bills, and we started working out what was the best way of dealing with that. Uh, so we introduced the five-wise technique. Um, any testers in the audience? What's wrong with the slide? <laughs> <laughs> Six. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so anything goes wrong, we are getting, we've been good for a while at five wise, but we actually now have five wise advanced training um, because we want to find the root cause of the issue. We don't want to know that actually something's gone wrong, we can fix it, we don't care about the fix, we care about why it went wrong in the first place. Actually delving right down into that issue, finding the original cause of it, and fixing that cause, not fixing what happened after, but fixing the root cause, and that's integral to how we work. So all these processes coming in, and now we haven't just got one team. We've got probably about five, six teams at this point, so how do we tell the teams how to work? Obviously, of course, we don't tell the teams how to work. The teams work out how to work for themselves. They work out what is best for their team. We don't blanket say this is the process, this is what you must follow, because every team is different. Every team has different individuals, different people in different roles, different people with different experience, working on different bits of the product. We can't say actually we'll work exactly this way, because that won't work for every single team. So each team works out what's best for them, iterates on it, improves on it. Uh, when people join the team, leave the team, it changes and they iterate and they find out what's best for the new team. But it's always up to that team to say, actually, this is the thing that works best for us. This is how we will uh, perform at our best. So talking about the people, um, do you get the IT crowd in Do you ever see that? Okay. Yes, yeah. okay. I uh, just want to make sure that makes some kind of sense. Uh, so we considered the people who worked here. We looked at careers, what they were doing, what they were to do next. Uh, so as part of that, for new roles, for new hire roles, we started to promote internally. Uh, and I think the last six UK dev managers have all been internal promotions. Um, so actually taking care of the people is integral, training them, ensuring that they, they have that opportunity to grow within the company. That's a huge thing for us. Uh, and it gives people more responsibility and people step up and really do take on new jobs, new roles, um, when those roles are become apparent. And some people will actually notice a niche and create that role for themselves and end up in a permanent role in that way. Um, talk about the people, other things we've done. Um, even from when I first started, uh, every member of staff in the department is allowed learning time every week, so they can go away um, and work out what excites them, what they want to learn about, what they want to be trained on. Things that they can't get inside the company, they will go away, read, look at the internet, try and find new stuff, read new books. But they're allowed, I think it's about two hours a week, or like half a day every two weeks, to actually have as their own personal learning time. It's not mandated what they do. People will be interested in like, if it's good, maybe you can feed it back to the rest of the team. But you're allowed to go away and actually learn for yourselves the things you are interested in. Uh, we talked about hackathons earlier. Uh, this is actually one of our hackathons. Uh, so Mario, uh, Mariano earlier is on the right. You can tell this is about four years ago um, because this is a dev team and they haven't all got beards. Every single one of those people now has a beard. Um, I was going to say, even with an icon. Um, but yes, so this is what we started doing. We do this, we do it three times a year, so we give everybody in the whole department two and a half days, go away, do what you want to. Um, about a third of them are stuff to do with the product, that they think we can actually improve the product for people. About a third of them are just experiments with the product, so new languages, new ways of working, um, new kind of code that they haven't used that will produce something different on our, on our product. Um, and it doesn't matter if we don't use it, it doesn't matter if it's thrown away after two and a half days, we give people the opportunity to actually to take the time um, and create something new. 
As long as you're learning from it, it's good. Go away, do it. Uh, even for the non-developers, we put in other things. So I think on a recent one, the Polish team pimped their office. Um, one year I did a, a video documentary of the hackathon as a little thing as well. Um, but you're not confined to anybody saying this is what you must. You have that opportunity three times a year to say two and a half days to create something that you're interested in. Um, obviously the department's getting bigger. Uh, more things are happening, more things we're trying to juggle. Uh, so the next thing we did uh, is we introduced specialist teams. Uh, tech support. Um, so teams we've introduced it, we have the robot football team of course, as well as that we have the performance testing team. Um, that was very early on, so we've actually had performance testing as a separate uh, part of the department for seven and a half years, I think. Um, it's a bit bigger team now, but we've had that as an integral thing, because obviously the number of customers, we want to make sure it works and it works fast enough for everybody. Um, an automated test environment team. Um, so even though the automated tests are created within the teams, we actually have another team who look after the environment, make sure it runs okay, make sure it runs quickly, make sure it's stable so that the, the teams can actually just put new tests into it without worrying whether they're going to uh, kill the whole environment. So we have a separate team for that. Uh, we have a separate security team, obviously web-based product, um, you need to be looking at making sure you can't be hacked, that it's working okay for everybody, that you can't see other people's data. So a security team, again, that's probably about four years ago we started doing security as a major, major thing. We always were doing it, but now it's a separate team. And now security is only like four or five people, security team at the moment. Uh, and we introduced a technical author as well. So actually we were creating all this new work, all this new code, all this new product was going out, uh, but all the actual documents were being written in the department, so we actually got somebody professional who could come in and produce standard documentation for our customers to use our product. Uh, and that's, and she's um, as important as anybody else on the team, so actually in kick off some things, one of the first things we do is look at whether we ought to get any technical author involved, because at the end of the day, we don't want to hand this to her and say, right, go and automate, go and write that up, we, were, we want her to be involved um, so she can do that right from the start. So when we put it live, it can be live, and it's live, not just the product, but the documentation side as well. And we took better care of the automation. Does anybody know what film this is? <laughs> this is one of my favorite, this is, um, this is Metropolis. Uh, Fritz Lang film, uh, 1920s. And do you go and see it? Um, basically, an uh, evil robot takes over the entire city. It's brilliant. Uh, if you've seen any Queen videos of uh, Radio Gaga, they will go be like that. That's from the middle. Anyway, so automation. Uh, so, what do we do about the automation? We have automation now. So, what are we going to do with that? Um, I've talked about the, the team who are looking after the environment. Um, but we're looking at speeding things up as well. Uh, probably about four years, four or five years ago, the automation, when we were running all the all the automated tests, it was probably taking about an hour and a quarter. I think it was about 12 minutes. Uh, and that's about four or five years of continually adding new tests, um, expanding what we're doing, expanding the product, and the the time to run the automated test has gone down by um, four fifths. Because um, that's important. We want that. Uh, feedback as soon as we can. We do not want something to put code in and then have to sit around two hours just to see if it works or not. We want the feedback as quick as we possibly can. Uh, so we want the test to run faster. How do we go about making sure that happens? Well, we look at the flaky tests. Uh, there were quite a lot of flaky tests. These are the tests that will run three times before they actually run well. We just keep running them in the hope they will actually work. These are the tests that take much longer than all the other tests. Um, so we've had people who've stepped up off their own back and said, actually, I'm now going to do a, a, a go through all the tests, work out what the flaky ones are, make sure they get fixed, hand them out to teams, say, look, if you put this, this test in, it doesn't work, it's really slow, uh, and they will go and fix it. So all of our tests now, we expect them all to run first time and to be quick. 
if they're not doing that, they're not good tests, they're slowing the whole department down, we'll get them. Uh, regression tests. Couldn't find a slide for regression tests. Um, so, about five years ago, we had about 10 testers, I'd say. Um, Friday afternoon was regression time. We had to get the entire test team in a room for an entire afternoon to run the regression before we put the product out to our customers. So that was, oh, what, 30 man hours every week just doing regression. Um, at the moment, we have one person who does it in under an hour. So in five years, we have stripped back all of that manual regression. We've got rid of as much of it as we possibly can. There's a couple of bits we're struggling to automate, but still it's gone from 25 plus hours to under one hour. Uh, and again, it's, it's freeing up people's time. It's making sure people are working on the important things. Rerunning the same test every single week is not an important thing for anybody. I, I hate regression testing. <laughs> Uh, in a previous company, um, we did two week sprints and we actually had two and a half days every sprint um, just doing regression testing. Uh, so now one hour for one tester is just glorious. And it means that we only have to do manual regression once every three months, I think, at the moment, which is fine by me. Uh, also, we're not just automating the things we've talked about so far, the regression tests. Or the new code, we're automating anything we can see that will give us an advantage, will speed things up. Uh, so, five years ago, if you wanted a new version of the uh, code base onto the test environment, you had to run it yourself. There was about a 30 line script, you had to go through every single line. It was so complicated and flaky that uh, only the developers who knew the code could run it. Um, we managed to get that up to about 12 lines, and then the testers with a bit of help could run it, then we got down to a single button, and now it's fully automated, and it has been for a couple of years. So any new code, three times a day, we'll put it on the test environment, nobody worries about it, it happens automatically, and we just continue on with our jobs. Uh, again, it's all those time-saving things where we're repeating the same job every single time, uh, we're automating all of those. That's pretty much phase two. Uh, so moving on to phase three. Uh, so at this point, we are a Bayesian Stoke office. Everybody is working out for Bayesian Stoke office. Uh, and we have a product that's based in the UK that other people in Europe can use, but it is only a European product. So the next thing, of course, uh, is we went global. Um, we weren't just a European product anymore. And that wasn't just the product, that was also the people. Um, so one of the things we did about that time was we opened a second development office. Uh, anybody local might recognize where that might be. Uh, I think this was the party that we had when we opened the office here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so new product, new continents. Uh, what do we need next? Uh, new sales teams. So we have two new sales teams. First one uh, in the US, we have an American sales team. The second team, uh, Australia, an Australian sales team. Please don't take photos of that one. <laughs> I won't be in trouble. Uh, obviously, now we are people working in multiple locations. Um, so, how do you deal with that? Um, I did warn Melissa, she was in the slide. She's in the slide. Um, so, Remote working, we talked about it earlier on with um, Evelina and uh, Mariana about the fact that he can work from anywhere. Um, and it took a while to get to that stage where we are fully remote and all our teams, it does not matter where you are. Uh, and we continue to improve, improve all the applications we use. Um, so this is, this is years ago. Um, but we were pretty good back then and we even better now. So everything is fluid. If you want to pair work with somebody, you can do it everywhere. If you're sharing the screen, you both want to enter some at the same time, you can do that. Uh, team meetings, that's fine as well. Um, so um, the team I work on, I actually work on the Ashley's team. Uh, we have five people who are based in the Basingstoke office, and the sixth person is based in New Zealand. 
uh, but we still have all our regular meetings with him and it all works absolutely fine. So just to give an overview, this is where we were when I first joined. Uh, and that was a big building. We were actually one corner of one floor of an office block when I first joined. Uh, I think before that we were in, in a smaller building somewhere else in Torquay. So that's where we are, were then. Uh, and this is pretty much where we are now. Uh, which is pretty staggering. And most of this is in the last three or four years. So obviously multiple uh, offices in Europe, multiple in the US, uh, offices in uh, Australia. This is Alan. Uh, but we have one of our ops guys who now lives in uh, South Africa, uh, Mariano in Spain quite a lot of the time. But it does not matter where you live. If you're a good person, you're a right person for the role, um, we'll make it work. And we do. So that's pretty much phase three. So phase four, 15 minutes. Uh, we're not a start now. I'm almost halfway through the slides. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. uh, so we're not a startup anymore. So what's the first thing you do when you're not a startup? Obviously, you buy your own building. Uh, and this is New Voice Media House in Basin Soap, and this is where we've been for about two and a half years now. Uh, and uh, so IT is the uh, middle floor, Ops is this side, and development's the other side. Um, and other teams are elsewhere. Um, but we have our own building, we have our own identity in that way. Uh, are there improvements we've made? Um, we realised that actually in development we worked really well. Uh, but people have been testing a long time ago, that whole problem was when you, uh, you had a product owner, you buy a specification, they throw it over the wall to the developers, they write it, throw it all over the wall to the testers. We don't do that, we've been pretty good at not doing that for a while, but we were still wanting to develop something to throw it over the wall uh, So this was our way of trying to ensure that we stopped doing that. Uh, and we've been doing that ever since and trying to improve on that. Uh, we had talks today about how ops uh, interact. And one of our development teams at the moment has a member of Ops in it permanently who can advise about everything they need to think about for when it actually goes live and how it can be supported. Uh, I can't say we're the perfect DevOps because there is no perfect DevOps, but the perfect DevOps for us. Every DevOps is different. Uh, so what else did we start doing? Uh, we introduced Chef. Uh, we've had a Chef for a while, not quite that loud. Uh, APIs. Who could do slides about APIs, really? Uh, we're API crazy, and we're focusing a lot on APIs at the moment. Uh, Docker, started using Docker, and of course, uh, AWS. This is the Amazon, in case it wasn't clear. Uh, I mean, one of the good things about using AWS, uh, when we first went from uh, just European and started creating nodes in other countries, uh, first new server we tried to create in North America, I think it took us about six months. Uh, I think the third or fourth took us about 30 minutes, um, mostly because of these kind of advancements. The things that we were having to set up that would take months and months were now taking days or hours or minutes. Uh, and that's the kind of improvements we're always looking to make. We're not trying to rest on our laws. We always know that however good we think we are, there is something we can do to improve. And that's kind of the philosophy of the department and the company ever since. Um, my favorite slide coming up, uh, we introduced microservices. <laughs> this is a very little man, just to say, it's not a perspective thing, and he's quite close and leaves a lot of pieces of So microservices, that's been a huge thing for us in the last couple of years. Um, uh, up to that point, we had a product. It was a large product. If you wanted to put anything new on the product, you made it an even larger product, um, which means it was harder to maintain, harder to deploy. Uh, so we're now using Microsoft. So any new kind of application that we're coming up with, we're actually looking at doing it as a separate thing so we can deploy it separately, uh, maintain it separately, uh, and everything is a lot quicker when you're doing that. It's Plus and minuses, but microservices are working well for us for a lot of products at the moment. Um, as part of the development process, we're not just waiting till we've built something and then thinking about security performance or monitoring. We're thinking about those as part of the story kickoffs. Uh, if we're creating a new feature, these are as integral as how it works to the customer because 
the people who are monitoring it, they're our customers too. Uh, ops is important, so we make sure we make it as easy for them to support it uh, in live as we possibly can. So we consider these things up front. I mean, security we have considered in, in the original feature kickoffs, probably from when I joined, performance pretty much straight after that, and monitoring the last couple of years, we create monitoring stories as we create the feature. So that all those alerts and monitoring things can be live as soon as the product goes live. And of course, we never forgot about the process. Process still did. Hugest cat. Awesome. Uh, and part of the process, um, these are the three amigos, but we did introduce the three amigos. Uh, me and Ashley will do that dance a bit later, it was 100 years. <laughs> This is the after party. Uh, being is important, uh, obviously, you want to have testers, um, product owner, and developer in every kickoff at least. And I want to stress that last bit at least. That's the very, very minimum. If you can get the whole team involved in each feature kickoff, you should. Uh, if you're going to be doing pair programming, the other developers should know what you're building. If you have all the one tester, each of the testers should know what you're building. I'm going to get rid of that one, we're just going to stay on the other things we've done, uh, last couple of years we started doing example mapping, which is another technique for concentrating on how the customer is going to be using. So it's looking at all of the scope and the use cases you can think of right at the very start. Uh, this is a, a free tool online. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I have to talk about it, but it's called Team Up Labs, um, but it's actually written by one of the guys in the park. He's a clever guy. So this we've been using, and half the time we use it at the moment, and it's a really useful tool, and I want a percentage, obviously, um, of nothing. Um, and shifting left, this is one of the other key things uh, about how uh, we work as a development team, about how important the testing is. It's not a question of developers finish and then hand over the testing. Uh, if something hits the test environment, that should be the last time the test to see it, not the first time, it should be the last time we see it. Up to that point, we should have been involved every single step of the way. We talked about um, dev test pairing earlier, and it's integral to how we work. Uh, first time I want to see new code, uh, uh, I want to see the new code on the development machine. As soon as they got something that works, I want to see it there. I want to give immediate feedback. If there's automated tests, I want to see them as soon as they are written, not when the feature's complete. If I can, I want to be tested on the developer machine. One of the things I've done recently uh, is I've uh, had permission to remote into the developer's machine. So he's in the code, I'm testing it on his machine, uh, and I've been doing that either next to the person or if they've been in the other office. It doesn't matter where you are geographically, you can still be testing with your developer at the same time. And that's been one of the things we've been really going for the last couple of years, is ensuring all of that testing happens so much earlier. Um, one of the things I want to do is we talk about five wise. I want to have five wise every time we find a bug on the test environment because I think we can get rid of a test environment sooner. I think we can get all the testing done before we get to a test environment. I don't think we need it anymore. We can still do get issues. We still get um, broken builds and things, and we deal with those in specific ways. If we have a broken build, it is stopping everything happening. That we want to. It's stopping our code going to our customers, which is what we want. So if we have a, an issue that somebody can't deal with, then we will swarm it as a department or as a sub team in the department to work out the problem and get it fixed as quick as we can. We have broken build rooms, so if something does go wrong for even like five minutes, people can see it and try and fix it. Uh, and if we have two broken builds in a row, we will stop the line. All development will stop on that product until we have fixed that issue. Uh, because getting that working is key. Um, I've got a couple of things to sum up, because uh, that's the end of phase four. In a year's time, phase five, we've just been bought with a whole new set of problems that we'll have to deal with. But that's pretty much what makes it interesting working here. Uh, four things we've learned while we're here. Uh, actually, there's five, number one, everybody likes cats. Uh, number one, uh, we hire people. We do not hire into roles, we hire people. It's the people who are important, not the role they are filling. Uh, that's kind of integral to how we hire. All right, automate everything you can. We are automating Ashley next weekend. Uh, process is key. We know that we all get a good product. 
but we know the process behind that is integral to getting the good product out and ensuring that we stay as ahead of the game if we can. And lastly, always look to improve. Uh, at no point have we said we've got this nailed, it's always what can we do to get it better. And that's the key thing. Key four things I think I've learned at the company for the last four years. And that is 66 slides, you know, uh, 14 minutes. Thank you very much. Does anybody want to ask a very sweet amount of questions? Five minutes, that's not a question, that's a sign. <laughs> we have about two minutes for questions if anybody has a question. Or they can meet me in the barn later, which is possibly a better place um, for questions. Oh. Can, can you tell me what's Chef, actually? I don't know what's. Um, Paul, what's Chef? Uh, Chef is a, a um, tool for automating deployments. So when we take our, uh, let's say, contact center um, and put it into AWS, okay. um, then we'll automate that with Chef. So basically, it's scripting. Okay, automation tool for uh, the deployment. Yeah. Okay, and uh, what's Docker? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, Docker is a way of uh, isolating uh, like the environment in which a, uh, uh, an application runs and making it um, something that you can kind of run anywhere. Uh, so the great thing about that is um, you can run it in AWS, but it's the exact same uh, thing as a developer can run on their laptop. Um, so it means, like one of the things Kevin said was, like get close to the, the uh, developer machine to do the testing. It means that the thing that you're running in production is exactly the same as the thing that you're running um, in development. Good. So, so the, this sort of analogy is like shipping containers, so you can have a Shipping containers can go on a lorry or go on a train or go on a boat, and it would be exactly the same. Yeah. It's, it's automating all of those little bits of the process that you don't even think need automating. But once you do, then things flow through much quicker. So anything like that with automate will find the best tool for us. Maybe just for a while, maybe a couple of years later, a better tool will come along. Um, but again, that's again that's that continual improvement and continually looking to see what we can do to improve. We have two questions. Okay. Uh, the first, if you uh, look back, what is the a is a uh, thing to implement in in your experience? If you you change something, yeah. What was the easier, and have the, the big uh, uh, effort, and what is the hardest? Um. It's the second. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, I guess the biggest thing, the automation is the biggest thing because the, the most improvements come out of that and the most speed comes out of that. And the most ability to not concentrate on the things that are the same every single week. So automation, I think, is the biggest thing and the best thing you can do, whatever situation you're in. If it's the same job you're doing every week, find a way of automating it. So I'd say that's the biggest thing. Um, and the thing with the hardest thing, what's the hardest thing? Uh, it's not working with Ashley. <laughs> that's absolutely fine. Um, yes, I think the expansion, again. actually, um, the hardest thing at some point is when we expand quickly. Um, first time I was a scrum master and I had a stable team. Um, and we were maybe changing once or twice every six months. And then we went through, through our first round of expansion and the team changed 13 times in six months. And that was really hard to keep that working well with that amount of change. I think when we have those growth spurts, that's sometimes really hard. And you've got to be really clever about how you control that kind of thing. And the project that had about the automation, one thing that's always been very important for us is to get feedback earlier. So the, the earlier you can tell that you've made a mistake or something wrong, we need to change the, the better because it's a lot 
the only easier it is to fix it. Yeah. And it's the same with the test dev relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's saying those relationships yeah. between test dev and docs. If you can yeah. push that left, then it's great. Can get a lot of feedback. Yeah. I mean, the thing, when I first started, even like 10 years ago, you'd, you'd find a bug on a system, then you'd have to go away, you'd have to recreate that bug with any um, variations you could. Then you'd go away and you write a bug report, then you submit the bug report, somebody would review the bug report, work out whether there's a bug or not, pass it to a developer, the developer would look at it, say that's not a bug, you'd have to go to them and say actually it is a bug, then they try to fix it, and then they'd have to put it on the test environment, then you go back and you test it two days later and work out whether it worked or not. And now that kind of two-day process we can do in 10 seconds. And uh, I think that's quite impressive for the, the process cycle. Okay, any more questions? Coffee time is up, I think. So see you on <laughs> Thank you very much.